Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome and good afternoon and welcome to the Kinesiology, welcome to the Department of Kinesiology Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Craig Harms and I serve as the department head in the Department of Kinesiology. And it's my pleasure to welcome you and see such a great turnout for this event. This fall's lecture series is in conjunction with Exercises Medicine on Campus Initiative, where this is our first year of bringing this program to Kansas State University. The focus of EIM is to engage the promotion of physical activity as a vital sign of health on university campuses. And if you look on the flip side of the handout that you came in today, you'll notice that one thing to point out is that there's a campus walk occurring a week from today at 12.30 that I encourage you to attend if you're able. Special thanks go out to Provost Mason and President Myers for officially signing a proclamation making K-State an exercises medicine on campus university. A couple of people I'd like to recognize before we get started. I'd like to recognize our Kinesiology Student Association for their involvement with this program and their help. Also special thanks to the chair of our seminar series, Dr. Carl Adi. Carl, would you stand please? back here in the way back, and also the chair of our Exercises Medicine on Campus Committee, Lauren McDaniel. Please join me in congratulating them and thanking them for their help with everything. <clears throat> well, I'm very pleased to introduce this fall's speaker, Dr. Stephen Blair. We've greatly enjoyed having Stephen on our campus the last couple days, interacting with faculty and students, and showing him the K-State hospitality that we typically try and show people. He already knows about the Midwest way of doing things as he's a Kansas native, so it's kind of coming home a little bit to him. Dr. Blair's bio is on the handout you've received on your way in. Since this lecture is being recorded, I'd like to highlight some of those achievements and encourage you to follow along as I read some of them. Dr. Blair is a retired professor in the Department of Exercise Science and Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the Arnold School of Public Health, University of South Carolina. And as he tells us, being retired means his work week is now down to 50 hours a work week, where it used to be 70 and 80 hour work weeks. So I don't know if that's really retired or not. Dr. Blair is past president of the American College of Sports Medicine, National Coalition for Promotion of Physical Activity, and the National Academy of Kinesiology. He has received awards from many professional associations, including a Merit Award from the National Institutes of Health, ACSM Honor Award, which is their highest award bestowed upon individuals, Robert Levy Lecture Award, and Population Science Research Award from the American Heart Association, and one of a few individuals outside of the US Public Health Service to be awarded the Surgeon General's Medallion. These are just a fraction of all the awards that you see from his CV. He has received honorary doctoral degrees from universities in the US, England, Belgium, and next week an additional one from Denmark. His research focuses on the association between lifestyle and health with a special emphasis on exercise, physical fitness, body composition, and chronic disease. He has published over 700 papers and chapters in scientific literature and was the senior scientific editor for the U.S. Surgeon General's report on physical activity and health. And so it is truly a pleasure to have someone who has distinguished himself as much as Steve has and made an impact on the association between physical activity and health as Dr. Blair. Today his talk will focus on the health hazards associated with physical inactivity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Blair to Kansas State University. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Harms, and I'm a little disappointed in you people. You come in here and sit in this auditorium and listen to some old codger babble on, and it's a beautiful day out there. You could be out, you could be playing soccer or taking a run or who knows what. But no, seriously, I'm really very honored to have been invited here to uh, uh, this uh, university. Um, here are my disclosures over the past five years. And one reason I'm happy to come here is the first college campus I ever stepped on was this one. I think about 1951. Uncle Raymond was in veterinary college. Grandpa and Grandma brought me down here from Jewel County 
Any people here from Jewel County? You know, there up there. Are you the same one I saw this morning? Only one kid in this place from Jewel County? But anyway, they brought me down to visit Uncle Raymond and Andy Morris, and I'm pretty sure that's the trip. They took me over to this place, and you know, I'd seen basketball games and Mankato, and going to this place, and where did all these people come from? They're here to watch this game, but anyway, it is a great pleasure to, to come back here. Why did it do that? Carl, your mouse is tricking me here. So I can't advance slides with that. You should be able to. But... That's what I tried to do. Yeah, maybe just point with that. I'm sorry, the lecture has to be canceled. I can't. I'm not smart <laughs> enough to. Uh, to work this uh, uh, this silly mouse over here, but we'll we'll see. So you said this one. So this is another uh, point uh, I wanted to mention. Some of you I know recognize Foxy, one of my good friends. I was visiting here. Jane and I were visiting him uh, just about a month ago, and uh, let me tell you, whenever I'm anywhere close to the UK, he gets a message. Dear Ken, we're coming. Are you going to be at home? We'll be there. And up in his guest room where we sleep is this, from here. So thanks for doing this for my friend, and I know he's grateful and was very happy to, to be here as a student, and then, of course, to get the award. Well, let's get on to the topic of, okay, non-communicable diseases, huge public health problem around the world. They cause most of the deaths, et cetera. Everybody here knows that. In 2012, the week before the Olympic Games in London, The Lancet devoted an entire issue to physical activity papers. I thought that was one. It was a brilliant young a guy from uh, Brazil, Pedro Halal, who organized this. And one of the papers was led by Dr. Aimin Lee uh, with, uh, uh, here are the key points from that uh, paper. So you see a lot of inactivity worldwide. Oh, it's pretty bad for you. Look at this. And I use the mouse for this, okay. Uh, same number of deaths as smoking. Now, that probably is a bit of a surprise to most of you. Inactivity causes many people to die, as does smoking, and of course a lot more than obesity. So it's a big problem. And then Pedro organized another, but he didn't invite me to be in this second one. I'm irritated with the boy. Uh, but in 2016, another uh, full issue of The Lancet. Can you imagine that? A journal like The Lancet, and this bright young guy persuades the editor to devote the entire issue to physical activity and health. So let me get to some data. I'll refer to work that I've been doing over the last uh, few decades with the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study. Uh, the cohort that I have, about 80,000 patients, a little more than 80,000 patients. Many of you probably know about the Cooper Clinic, but just very briefly, it is a preventive medicine clinic. They give examinations, very thorough exams. The exam takes four, five, six hours. Each doctor in this clinic sees three patients a day. Or maybe if somebody's out sick, they'd have to see four and then complain about it for a couple of weeks. But I mean, it's the reason for me, it's a very thorough exam. Lots of lab tests. And of course, what I've been focused on is CRF, cardiorespiratory fitness, maximal exercise test on the treadmill. So we followed this group for morbidity and mortality. And I will get to some of those data right here. Our first major paper on fitness and mortality was published many years. Oh my gosh, that's I was that almost 20 years ago or 30 years ago or whatever it is, uh, for women and for men in the low fit group, much more likely to die than those who are at least moderately fit. The high fit, a little better uh, risk. Now, to give you some, I'll tell you a little more in a minute about. What, what this moderate fitness means, but it's the bottom 20% in each age gender category. So this is the least fit one-fifth. The moderately fit are the next 40% in the distribution, and the high fit 
are the highest 40%. So even though I keep thinking maybe we put the wrong name, is this really high fit? These are not marathon runners and triathletes. It's merely the top 40% of the distribution. Now, of course, they are physically active. And what do you have to do to be moderately fit? Well, as we look at the data, uh, in this uh, uh, study, we have on the medical history, we do have some reasonably extensive physical activity questionnaires. And published this paper again many years ago. But those who reported walking, the women and the men, you know, 135, 145 minutes a week of walking. If it's running, you know, 180 or 80 some minutes a week. If aerobics class is there, form of exercise that's intermediate in intensity, so it's intermediate in number of minutes. So you, you will, all of you probably know, these numbers are pretty consistent with our current recommendations of 150 minutes a week of moderate and uh, 75 minutes a week of vigorous. Now, one of the papers um, in The Lancet that I mentioned earlier, led by Dr. Lee, again, 5.3 million deaths, and I will say this is an underestimate of the real effect of inactivity. And I argued and argued and argued with my colleagues who were writing this paper, said we should include fitness in this because inactivity isn't as good a measure, a questionnaire is not as good a measure of a person's actual habits as if we had an objective measure of their fitness. Now I know I've been talking to uh, uh, Dr. Harms here over the last couple of days and I think he exaggerated a little bit when I asked him about his physical activity. But if I take them in one of the labs over here and put them on the treadmill, you can't lie to the treadmill. You go to exhaustion as we got together. You all know I'm joking about that. But the, the reason is maximal, actually, again, you can't lie to the treadmill. You can't fake it. You go to exhaustion, and that's an indicator of how fit you actively are. So these data we published, again, several years ago from this cohort, again, using the physical activity questionnaire data, and here, low, moderate, high activity in women and men. Well, this is statistically significant. There is a gradient across low, moderate, and high activities. But in the same group, the same uh, database look at the difference when we look at fitness. A much bigger reduction in risk in the moderate and high fit for both women and men. And, when we use it, and the reason is this measure is just not as accurate. So again, the paper we had in the Lancet showing that uh, number of deaths, that was based on physical activity. And this, that's, this is why I say that's a real underestimate of how big a problem inactivity is in the world. So when we published that first paper on fitness and uh, uh, mortality, of course, got a lot of criticism. Well, fitness is genetically determined. So how can that be? Well, I don't know much about genetics. But can you name me anything we can measure in human beings that doesn't have a genetic component? There are some of us who are normal height. And then there's some genetic freaks. <laughs> where's, where's the dean? And, uh, oh, they're way up there, look at that. And then there are some guys, middle-aged and older, who have normal heads. And then look at these guys, they got all that stuff up on top. So yeah, everything has a genetic component. So how could you look at that to see, well, is fitness really pretty? Well, then uh, uh, shortly, after, shortly later, uh, we looked at fitness change. As we got enough people who had had two or more exams, so we could look at fitness at baseline and then fitness at their last exam. And there are a little over 10,000 men in, in this uh, analysis. And why didn't we include women in this? Well, the reason is, you women, I'm sorry to tell you this, are just poor subjects for studies like this. 75% of the population is men, and 25% are women, and the darn women won't die. Now, if you're an epidemiologist, and Halloween's coming up, Halloween costume, epidemiologist, because we go around and count up dead bodies. So there you go. And you know, again, I'm joking about that. But again, with the smaller number of women and, and the number of the death rates in women are lower, for some of these analyses, there just weren't enough endpoints to carry out the analysis. So again, in these 10,000 men, at least two exams, some of them had 20 exams, we looked at the first and last exam and classified them here. They weren't fit at either one. So can the people here read, do you think? Yeah. They can read this. Okay, good, thanks. 
So here are the death rates by age groups in this group of men, those who were never fit, and look at those who improved their fitness. The death rates dropped dramatically in each one of these age groups. Those who were always fit, yeah, they, they had a lower death rate because they'd been fit a longer period of time. And I was so happy, because I think maybe it was almost 60 when we did this study. Yeah, look, even in this older age group, getting out, you can change, you get out of that low fit group, cut your risk of dying in half during the follow-up period. And then, of course, so what about uh, cardiovascular disease? So we did have enough women in this analysis to look at overall or at the cardiovascular disease death rates and look at this trend across low, moderate, and high fitness. And I know some of you people I've been visiting with here uh, uh, probably have a hard time believing this, but there are people out there who don't like me. And they say, Blair doesn't do any new research. He just makes new slides. Well, they do kind of all look similar, don't they? Get out of that low fit group and look at the much lower cardiovascular disease death rate during this follow-up in both women and in men. Now, in the men, we had the opportunity to do a little more detailed kind of cross analysis so we could look here at their fitness level, low, moderate, and high. Did they have any of the standard risk factors? No, any one of the standard ones, any two or all three. So look at this. The death rate in the guys who had all these other risk factors who were high fit, that death rate I think is about 23 per 10,000 man years of observation. And that is lower than the low fit guys who had none of the other risk factors. Are right, you beginning to get the picture? Fitness is pretty darn important. And how do you get to be fit? Regular physical activity. Uh, we couldn't carry out quite the same kind of analysis in women, but it's the same pattern, low, and these are moderate or high fit. And again, look at this group, look at that group. Yeah, being fit is good for you. And it's not only stuff we've done and the, the papers I've been showing you so far, have papers published several years ago. Well, here's one published just a few months ago, Barry Franklin's group uh, up in Detroit. Here's the reference if you want to find it. And they were looking at, again, objectively measured fitness in, in their lab and early mortality after you had a heart attack. You may not understand this yet, but most of the people in this room are going to have a heart attack. What? Yeah, someday. Most of you are going to have a heart attack. And some of you have a little better understanding and appreciation of that than these little babies we have here. But uh, most of us are going to get a heart attack. So, but that doesn't have to kill you. It might kill you, sudden cardiac death, but surviving after that heart attack. So Barry and his group is looking at fitness and survival or early mortality. A reasonably large group of patients. Uh, had more women, a higher percentage of women than we've had, but still uh, more men. And again, exercise testing, measured exercise capacity, and this they sorted them into these categories, maximal METs. And as you see here, the definition for early mortality, did you die within a month of having your heart attack or three months or, or whatever. So here are the results from this project. The more fit individuals here, had less than half the risk of dying early compared with those who were least fit. So not only it can prevent your heart attack, but if you have a heart attack, you're more likely to survive at least over a longer period of time. Well, there are other health outcomes that we could consider. So here, uh, and we've studied this in men as well, but I'll show this for, for women. Uh, incident hypertension, new development of hypertension after their first examination, and you see there's a relatively small number, 157, developed hypertension, but yeah, Steve just makes new slides. They kind of keep looking the same, don't they? Low, moderate, high fitness. And this is one paper I really like. Ian published it 10 years ago. But all of these men had physician-diagnosed hypertension. It was in their medical record. They'd had physician-diagnosed hypertension. So at the time of their exam, uh, some of them, their blood pressure was normal. So their blood pressure was controlled. Some of them, they were still a bit elevated, stage 1 hypertension. And these guys were in stage 2 hypertension. And you know... 
Can some of you guess where I'm going with this thing next? Yes. Those in stage two who were still, they were all hypertensive, remember that. Those who were still in stage two hypertension, but they were high fit, had a much lower risk of cardiovascular disease than those whose blood pressure was controlled, but who were low fit. Now, I'm not saying don't have your blood pressure controlled. In fact, I take blood pressure medication. My blood pressure has been elevated for quite a number of years. But that's not, I tell Doc, okay, you, you, you've got your patient's blood pressure under control, but don't congratulate yourself too much until you know well, which one of these categories is he or she in. And then here in women, uh, fitness and breast cancer mortality. And I can see some of you already, you're getting tired, low, moderate, high fitness, significant trend, et cetera. Seems to be good to prevent breast cancer. That, now, I'm actually not very concerned about that myself. I don't think I'm gonna get breast cancer, but uh, well, some men do, actually, so we'll have to see. Well, then let's look at uh, fitness, health, activity uh, in older adults. So again, May Sue, my colleague, uh, published this several years ago. Uh, you can, you, again, you can all read. Uh, when she did this, I told her this was, let's do a study on men and women in the prime of life. And I have been nagging her recently because I think the definition of prime of life has changed. I think it's 75. I'm gonna try, I keep trying to get her to do this in these older, older people. But anyway, uh, in these uh, older uh, individuals, again, showing the death rates across the fitness categories. And uh, these are men and women in this analysis, uh, adjusting for sex, age, and so forth uh, in the examination. But again, look at this. The codgers, I mean, I'm not even up there yet. In the 80, I will be in less than two years, but not today. And the ones who were high fit, their risk of dying was half that of those who were 25 years younger who were low fit. Are you getting the picture? Inactivity, which leads to low fitness, is the biggest public health problem in the world, at least according to your crazy lecture today. Now, some of you, some of I can tell you, you and some others, you know you're gonna die, right? You are gonna die. Now, some of you, what, I'm gonna die? Yeah, the death rate is actually one. Everybody dies. So, some of us know that we, or, or accept that we are going to die, but one thing you want to avoid before dying is to be, have your, what, what is this organ up here? Uh, uh, to, uh, I, I don't want to have my lungs be, I mean, my, my uh, yeah, dementia. I'd like to avoid dementia on up through absolutely the end of life. And, well, look at the data here. Fitness and risk of dementia. If uh, when we did, we analyzed this or defined it, you know, a physician, a physician, when you die, a physician fills out a death certificate and it lists the primary cause of death, secondary causes, other causes of death. And if you don't want the doc to have to write dementia on your death certificate, again, you're a lot better off if you maybe maintain your fitness. And then another thing, we don't, us older codgers, we don't want to get demented, but we also don't want to be the point we can't do anything. I'm gonna say a little more about this from a randomized trial later. But uh, uh, you wanna still take your wife out dancing, right? Yeah, and do some fun things. Go for a walk. So maintaining physical function is crucial. And again, you kids don't understand this yet probably, but those of us in the prime of life know it's something we'd like to ignore or like to avoid. So here, a paper published very recently, um, a meta-analysis, several uh, studies looking at a cognitive, oh, th this is cognitive decline, I'm sorry. Still cognitive decline. Uh, so dementia and so forth. And, uh, oops. Well, I must have 
messed up my slide somehow. But anyway, this study also showed that people who walk more, can walk faster, are less likely to have cognitive decline. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, and I know this wonderful college here, College of Ecology, has a lot of different disciplines included. I know it includes nutrition, and uh, I'm talking about how important activity, in a, activity is as a risk factor. I do believe that inactivity is the biggest public health problem. If you believe that it's uh, uh, eating, well, show me some data. I don't, I don't think we have compelling data to support that. But I do believe in healthy eating. So one of the papers we published again several years ago, we do have in a subset of the population this uh, dietary record, three-day dietary records. So uh, Marianne Hero, who was uh, Bob Ross's student up at Queen's University, did this analysis and came up with what uh, she called the unhealthy eating index. So in this definition, more, and well, you can again all read. These are the items in the unhealthy eating index. And there was a higher risk of all-cause mortality in those at the, uh, with the highest level of unhealthy eating index when compared with those at the lower level. So then, of course, I said, well, uh, we have to look at how fitness comes into this model. So here, high, moderate, low cardiorespiratory fitness, and this is low, moderate, high, unhealthy eating index. So the high is the most unhealthy eating index. Well, as the previous slide, yeah, there is a trend that uh, the, the, the people in the low unhealthy eating index, they are more likely to survive. But you look at this slide, again, the fitness seems to be a more powerful determinant. Well, it's measured more accurately than we can measure diet. But I do still believe. Who did I have breakfast with this morning? And what did I have? Raisin Bran. Oh, they didn't have a banana for me this morning, and I complained about that. But, uh, <laughs> but then, since I eat cereal, whole grain cereal, fruit every morning, and occasionally I'll have a little bit of eggs and maybe a partial biscuit with gravy. That's all right. But I do believe in healthy eating, and that is lots of fruit and vegetables, uh, whole grains rather than all highly processed grains, and, and so forth. Now, there, as, as most of you know, I think most of you are kinesiologists, there are several kinds of fitness. I've been talking about cardiorespiratory fitness, but then there is muscular strength. Okay, we have some data uh, in, in this cohort. Uh, in a subset of the individuals, uh, we have maximal, uh, one repetition max bench press, one repetition maximum leg press on, I forget the number, but uh, not the entire cohort. So we take their scores from these uh, maximal strength tests and combine it and come up with uh, uh, an index and then sort them into, uh, I think for most of the analyses, into thirds of uh, strength. Okay, we look at uh, muscle strength and all-cause mortality. Get out of that bottom third. Cardiovascular disease mortality, get out of that bottom third. So doing strength training is also good for reducing your mortality risk. Also, for cancer mortality, bottom third, get out of that bottom third. You're going to be less likely to die of cancer. And you will notice, I haven't pointed out in every slide, but all of these data that I'm showing you are, I, I work with someone like May Sue, really smart statisticians and people who know how to do these analyses. We statistically adjust for all kinds of potential uh, confounders. Strength and mortality in men with hypertension. So the physician diagnosed hypertension and uh, followed up for quite a few years, only 183 deaths, but fairly small cohort. Again, muscular strength, et cetera. So the hypertense of men with high muscular strength had a lower risk of dying. Get out of that bottom. Now this, this one, yeah, that's still significant. No, this is significant. This one may not be this, but the trend is there. And then even in this analysis, when we put cardiorespiratory fitness in the model, okay, the trend is no longer statistically significant. I don't care what the statistics say. This is still an important trend. And actually, this number is statistically significantly lower. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So I like to tell doctors, do not tell your patient with hypertension to don't do any lifting. Now you need to teach them, or somebody needs, some exercise scientist needs to teach them how to do strength training, lifting properly so that they're not creating a sudden death, um, probably uh, doing the, the training, but doing strength training is also good for people with hypertension. In fact, I'll bet it's good for everybody, no matter whether they have any health problems or not. And we published this just a, a few weeks ago. Uh, this one is looking at metabolic syndrome uh, as an outcome. So resistance training, no, they don't do resistance training. Uh, or uh, yes, they do resistance training. This is yes, aerobic training, no aerobic training. And you see the highest risk group is those who don't do either aerobic or resistance. And the lowest risk group is those who do both. So both of these kinds of fitness and therefore kinds of training are in fact important. And of course there are other kinds of fitness that we could talk about that I'm not gonna take the time to do, but uh, uh, balance and balance training, flexibility, my nagger, you know, she says I should call her my encourager, keeps after me to do that flexibility stuff. And well, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm still flexible, so it, it's okay. <laughs> but there are, seriously, other kinds of fitness. Cardiorespiratory fitness and muscular strength, I think, are kind of at the top of the list. Well, fitness and fatness. Every day in the newspaper, you find something, obesity, 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 oh my goodness, it's the worst thing that ever happened to human beings. Uh, it has caused ISIS. It has caused all, uh, all sorts of problems. And uh, okay, there is an obesity epidemic around the world. No question about that. But several years ago, we just said, well, what about fitness and fatness? I mean, does fitness kind of reduce the risk if you are obese? Now. You may know what I was hoping we would find when we did this research. Yes, okay. But uh, here's, the, I really like this paper Tim did, because these are all men sick. They all have physician-diagnosed diabetes. And here are the normal weight ones, low, moderate, high fitness. The overweight ones, low, moderate, high fitness. And then the obese ones, now, there aren't a lot of obese guys who are high fit. If you look around this auditorium, you can find at least one. And I can prove it on the treadmill. So, but anyway, for the analyses, as we do in epidemiology, there aren't enough high fit ones to look at that group separately. So these are at least moderately fit. So these are guys who are moderate or high fit. And again, look at the differences. The obese guys who were at least moderately fit, here's the risk of cardiovascular disease mortality, and compare that to the normal weight guys who are not fit. Fitness is so much more important as a risk for mortality, many health outcomes. Now one area where it is not as important and I will tell some of you, you young punks like this. If you are, okay, if you're kind of a fat guy and you want to ask that really cute girl to go to the junior prom with you, you will have better luck if you're not fat. So, and, and, and then seriously, we have, we have good data on this next point. Uh, there's bias against obesity in just kind of every aspect of life. If you're, if you're trying to get a new job, you're better off if you're not obese. And if you want promoted, probably not at this great institution or mine, but if you want to obe there's bias against obesity. So I'm not saying we should ignore it. I've struggled with my weight my whole life and I keep struggling eating that healthy diet. And I've told some of you this, on my 70th birthday in 2009, and by the way, my birthday is July 4th. Have you heard of that day? So you will all know when to send me that uh, box of champagne. Uh, July 4th, I set a goal, five million steps a year. So in my 71st year, I made it, yeah. 
So the next year, okay, I'll do it again. So I'm now in my 79th year and one quarter into my 79th year, and I'm ahead of the schedule. So I think I'll make it this year as well. So uh, uh, yes, I am physically active. Now, if you are overweight or obese, will you be better off if you lose weight? Again, I keep struggling, try to lose some weight. Will it make a difference in mortality? You cannot go to the doctor's office and not be weighed on the scale. I say, oh no, you don't need, to. get on the scale, fat boy, we want to see what you weigh. <laughs> but I did figure out just recently how to deal with that. The nurses in the doctors where I go, they weigh me, and then I get off the scale, and they say now, because they're going to calculate my BMI, and they say, how tall are you? I think somewhere between 6'3 and 6'4. <laughs> I'm no longer obese, according to that doctor. I'm even skinny. So I like this paper D.C. Lee uh, published a few years ago. Uh, you can, well, again, you can all read. Uh, all of these guys had two exams. Over 900 of them died during the follow-up period. And to, we did exclude those who already had chronic disease, those who died in the first year. Well, maybe they were they already had some chronic disease they didn't know about and that was affecting their weight or they had uh, uh, BMI uh, below the normal category so uh, looked at changes in BMI and changes in fat no, I'm sorry changes in fat changes in body weight and change in fitness across fifths of each of those variables well you see changing and some of these guys lost weight, some maybe gained a little weight, but changing weight made no difference, not associated at all with mortality risk during this follow-up. And what is this line? Yeah, cardiorespiratory fitness. Those who improved and improved more, linear trend. And again, I'm not saying ignore the obesity epidemic. I'm not saying try to control, that you should, shouldn't try to control your weight. But I will tell you, it isn't nearly as important as most of the world thinks it is. You're bombarded all the time with oh, obesity epidemic. Every week in leading scientific journals, I can find a paper, obesity and health outcome X. And I said, well, what, what, how did they measure activity or fitness? And it's not even mentioned in the article. Now, those of you who are scientists, physical activity, kinesiology, science, you know, you could never get a single article published in any journal on physical activity or fitness and anything if you didn't at least mention weight or BMI or muscle mass or percent fat. But they can get it all the time. Not every paper, but every week I can find papers. Oh, thank you. <coughs> I get irritated by this stuff. So, fitness, yeah, maximal exercise test does cost, and people have asked me, do you think everybody, all adults in the United States, need to get a maximal exercise test? No, I don't think that's, and every medical center doesn't have to do maximal exercise testing, I mean, there's good data and so forth, but it does cost. But the, the way I've been using it, as you can tell, is, well, it's a measure or an indicator of a person's physical activity regular physical activity, which is the important variable. There are other ways to get that kind of exposure for studies. All right? Accelerometers, step counters, objective measures of physical activity. And I think, frankly, uh, that's maybe even a better measure than fitness. Okay, there could be a genetic influence on whether you take steps or not, but measurement, objective measurement of physical activity is very important. So here's some work we've done recently in uh, the REGARD study. This is a big multinational study uh, uh, led by a group down at the University of Alabama, uh, Birmingham, a national yeah, more. Uh, it is a, a national cohort, uh, most from, I don't know if you know, but we call it the stroke belt down there where, where we live, and that's 
this, where the stroke rates are the highest uh, in the country. So more than half of them from there, and the rest from around, I forget where all the centers are, around the United States. Some reasonable balance between racial uh, ethnic groups and uh, near 50% balance between men and women. So here uh, we looked uh, recently, I guess it was published last year, uh, on, oh, and we, we got a, a, an extra grant to get accelerometers to put on the regards patients. They didn't have it in or the regards clients. They didn't have that in the original study. We got additional money, got accelerometers, they put them on the people, and uh, so here are data on cognitive function. So again, 6,400 people. Uh, and they get regular exams and regular questionnaires from the REGARD study. And so in this analysis, you can see 346 cases of cognitive impairment. And you look across, excuse me, the quartiles of moderate to vigorous physical activity, again, get out of that bottom, in this case, 25%. And your risk of becoming impaired is much lower. And then just, this is just a few weeks ago, we published this one, same cohort, uh, same database uh, on mortality. And again, the least active, the fewest steps, et cetera. And the, I mean, this is the most steps. And these are the fewest. Look, uh, look at uh, 2.6 times higher risk of dying in those who were the least active. It's good for you. And then, of course, as an epidemiologist, I've been challenged. So, yeah, that's just epidemiology. And you've all, you, most of you are not epidemiologists, but you've heard on the news, or you've seen in various papers you've read, well, observational studies can't prove causation. You can't prove causation with epidemiology. Well, I've kind of fought against that. But I do, I did get a, a $10 million grant, and I'm getting ready to do a new study and Dr. Harms has the sign-up list here that you can come down after and sign up. Because we need to do a randomized clinical trial on parachutes. There's never been one. So you get in this trial, and you might get in the group that actually gets a parachute. Or you get in the group that it looks like it might be a parachute. And we take you up to 10,000 feet, out you go, and you pull. Oh my God, I got in the wrong group. There's, there's never been a randomized trial on parachutes. So you know what I'm saying. We can establish causality by observational studies, by epidemiological studies. And we can't just jump on every study and every finding and say, well, this proves it. But as more and more studies show the same thing, different populations, anyway, uh, we can establish cause. But I do believe also in randomized trials. And I have been fortunate to be able to do some of these. Uh, this one, dose response to exercise in women, did this several years ago when I was in Dallas, and well, Tim Church really did all the work, but uh, these overweight, postmenopausal, uh, mildly hypertensive women, randomly assigned to these groups. Now this, I liked it when we started this, and I still like to express energy expenditure as calories per kilogram per week. Not calories per day, because that 110-pound woman, is she going to do as many calories from walking a mile as I do? No, let's talk about calories per kilogram. So this is the dose. This is the 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week. This is half of that, and this is one and a half times that. So this was the um, study we uh, did in these women. And I'm bragging on Tim, not me, because he led the study and did all the work. But those of you who do randomize clinical trials, uh, I'd like to throw out a little challenge for you. You know, this was, uh, 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 how long was it, did I say? What was the length? Of? Six months, I think. But anyway, all the exercise in the lab, we counted every footstep, every watt on the cycle ergometer. And look at this. Out of these 230 people in the randomized trials groups, this many had 100% adherence to the exercise dose. Beat that. I'm throwing out a little challenge for you here. See if you can beat it. Well, 
I'm bragging on Tim, not me. But I am saying, and we did have really good adherence in this study. And here, change in DO2 max. Some of you physiologists, I don't really know where all you guys, gals are going with VO2 max. Is it a good measure, lousy measure? I don't care. That's what we used in this study. So the control group, you know, they lost a little bit over this time. And look at this nice linear response. But this, half the recommended physical activity dose, they had a significant improvement. 5% difference between those in the control. And here, the recommended dose. And if you do more, yeah, you improve a bit more. And then a paper I, I like, Corby Martin led. He, he works with Tim and, uh, uh, at the Pennington. Because we also had data on whatever, SF36 or is that what it is, something like that. Uh, so change in mental health. Well, get out of the, if you're not in the control group, maybe this group does even better. But uh, yeah, significant changes in overall mental health. And here's the one I really love, energy. All three, no difference, no significant difference between these groups. All of them felt more energetic. And this came along, uh, I think shortly after, I had a fellowship at the Technical University of Munich and was over there three or four times a year. And they said, well, we're having, on your next trip, we're gonna have an exercise in cancer um, program and want you to present a paper and we're going to have a uh, uh, reporters in and uh, let them ask questions the night before. Will you come to the press conference? Yeah, sure, okay. And so go to the press conference and of course, yeah, it's in Germany. They're talking German. But my friend is whispering in my ear because there was an old lady that had breast cancer, an old man that had, had prostate cancer surgery, and they got in Martin's program and they were exercising. And when they were asking this woman questions, she was just lighting up. And Martin was saying, she had congenital hip defects. She was always physically inactive her whole life. And after she had this surgery and the doc sent her to my program, she, we got, and she was telling them how great she felt. So I thought, will physical activity make her live longer? Well, hopefully, maybe it will. But if it doesn't, she's living better. She's got energy, ready to do things. So, and then uh, this, uh, getting close to the end here, another study that, uh, I, I like our studies, of course. Uh, the, the Lifestyle Independence for Elders study. Is physical activity better than a health education program? And a major mobility disability, as the geriatricians on this study define, is inability to walk 400 meters in 15 minutes. I think even I can do that, right? 400 meters in 15 minutes, not a very high standard. And they say when you can't do that, it's a catastrophic health event. I mean, your life kind of falls apart. I mean, you can't go out with your grandkids and take them to the park, et cetera, et cetera. So preventing major mobility disability was the primary outcome in this study. Now, we did recruit people in the prime of life for this study. Look at this. Average age was about 79. They did have to be sedentary to come in the study. They did have to be able to walk 400 meters. And they went in the structured physical activity program, or they would come in for lectures and you know, discussions about managing your finances in, in retirement, or et cetera, et cetera. So they had contact with staff. Oh, and by the way, another point, uh, we recruited those who had a, a short physical performance battery score of below nine, nine or below. That score ranges from zero to 12, and it's how many times can you stand up 10 times in a out of a chair, and then there's some balance things. Can you stand like this with your eyes closed for 10 seconds? Of course, I don't have to prove that. Then. Can you stand like this with your eyes closed for 10 seconds? Yeah, I still do that. Now, you see this? One foot in front of the other. Can you stand like that with your eyes closed for 10 seconds? Yeah, I can do that. No problem. <laughs> But uh, balance as you get older, some of you, some of you may already know, <laughs> some of you will find out. So that uh, the short physical performance matters. So people were incapacitated in a way they didn't have to be able to participate in the intervention. And again, the primary outcome, I think this is from our center, is just put these uh, pylons 
20 meters apart and up and down and up and down until you get to 400 meters. And it doesn't have to be around a track and running. These people are not going to run, but can they do 400 meters in 15 minutes? And here are the results. I'm really, oh, I like this. And we published it a couple of years ago. We don't have it on here. Published in JAMA. Well, we got Marco Pahor to deliver these results at the ACSM annual meeting. He gave the keynote lecture for exercises medicine. And the same day we coordinated this, so JAMA released this paper on the same day. Isn't that fun? ACSM liked it, all the um, news events and so forth. But here, the physical activity group. Again, remember these are old, frail, sick people. In fact, when we were doing the pilot study in four centers, Tim came one day and said, Steve, I don't know, these are all, they're sick and frail. And, and even I wonder, in this population, old, frail, sick, feeble, should we randomize them into exercise? Well, the answer is yes. They, they, more of them declined, or some of them declined over this time, on up into their 80s, but not as many declined as those in the health education group. The difference here, as you can see, is 28% lower risk in the physical activity group. I guarantee you, there will never be a genetic drug or other intervention that will reduce risk of persistent mobility disability in a population like this. So again, obviously, I like our study. So just to summarize, and um, yeah, Craig, I think in another two or three hours I'll be, I'll be wrapped up here, so that's good. Uh, <clears throat> really pleased that uh, uh, this, uh, just a few months ago, uh, the American Heart Association released this AHA scientific statement that you can see here on cardiorespiratory fitness. Well, that's what I've been babbling on about here this afternoon. Uh, if you have any interest in it at all, I suggest you obtain this from the American Heart. And uh, again, the American Heart is now behind these fitness measures that some of us have been pushing for for some time. And in this, uh, there is a thing called estimated fitness. And Tony Jackson, I talked to somebody about Tony earlier, he, he first did this 30 years ago. You can, he, can, he came up with a formula where you can estimate a person's VO2 max from age, gender, smoking, physical activity habits. And then we did had a big meeting and had people from around the world with several big databases and we looked at it in that, and yeah, in all of them. It, uh, it's a reasonable measure. So everybody doesn't, have to do. And this is better than just a simple uh, physical activity questionnaire. So this is uh, a paper published uh, reason. I think this one is the one from some colleagues in uh, Norway. But you see in both men and women, estimated fitness and all-cause mortality. It may not be quite as steep a trend here for them, but it's still a significant trend. So as we say in this American Heart paper, you don't even really have to measure fitness if you know, think it cost too much, you're not able to do it, use this estimate, see where the person stands on the estimate. So finally then to attributable fractions, and I know there's some epidemiologists uh, in the audience, and we like to calculate this, it's well how many deaths in a population can we attribute to some particular characteristic? And this is based on these two items here, like the strength of the association. I've been showing you fitness is pretty strongly associated with health outcomes. And then the prevalence of the condition. Now suppose, oh, suppose Rolls-Royce automobiles were just death traps. I don't care. I've never been in one. How many of you own a Rolls-Royce? Yeah. Suppose Toyota Corollas were death traps. Caused a lot more deaths in the population. So you see it's how strong is the association and how many people are exposed to this variable. So calculate attributable fractions. And here's one we did several years ago. And each of these, this is the, what happened to that? It's supposed to be the percent of deaths observed. This large group of people, I forget the number of deaths, but it was a lot. Uh, this is the percentage of deaths that the, calculation showed where we could attribute to these different risk factors. And each one of these is adjusted for age and year of exam and all of these other risk factors. So note that 16, 17% of the deaths in the population, we say were due to low fitness. 
obesity, two or three percent. The only thing that was even close was hypertension in men. I'm not saying ignore any of these other risk factors, but this is one reason I say inactivity, which leads to low fitness, is the biggest public health problem in the world. And what do you have to do? Well, you're all familiar with the U.S. recommendations, the World Health Organization recommendations, and more come out in different countries. And this is very consistent. This hasn't changed much since the Paid et al. paper uh, in the mid-1990s on 150 minutes of moderate intensity act. No, however they phrased it, it was the same as it was 30 minutes a day in 10-minute bouts or more on most, comma, preferably all, comma, days of the week. So that had kind of be 150 minutes a week. And this has been now adopted and is pretty consistent around the world. So get out there and get people moving around, get their fitness level up. They don't have to be marathon runners, but just get them out of that low fit category. Thanks for your attention. Thank you everybody for attending. If you do have questions, I encourage you to come down to the front. Dr. Blair will be happy to answer those. Again, thank you very much for your participation. Hmm.